Okay, welcome back. We are going to be going through uh, part five and part six in this uh, next hour or so that we have together. We need to buckle down and get through poetry and wisdom and then of course all the minor prophets. So there's, there's quite a bit for us to bite off. So we'll jump right into it. So we're going to get into poetry and wisdom literature. This is some of the most worshipful language can, uh, found in scripture. Uh, these books, mostly written by David and by Solomon. I mean, you think about the book of Psalms, a big section of, uh, of this poetry literature, as well as um, wisdom such as uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. It's a big part of it. But um, this is shows such an honest expression of human emotion. That's why I love it. You, when you're reading through uh, all of these books, there's just this, this real um, honest evaluation of life i love how specifically how in psalms david just pours out his heart towards the lord uh, and just expresses it uh, so truthfully and so in such a raw way so let's look at some of these books we'll jump into the book of psalms now the title comes from uh, a greek word which means a song sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument right it's a song uh and it's sung the Psalms are a collection of hymns, prayers, and poems that cover the whole gamut, right, of human emotion. If from praise to, to anger to, to sadness and, and confusion, and there's just so many emotions. In fact, you read the Psalms, most of them, you'll see all of them within it. I mean, they go from these high emotions and low emotions and back up and it's just, there's just so much that's found within this. Uh, as far as human emotions. And these were used in, in worship to express praise. And really the Psalms reflect our own journeys with the Lord. How in given situations we go from being sad, but when we put our hope in the Lord and our hope is, you know, and so it's really a, a journey of our worship to the Lord. And the Psalms contain a wide diversity of subjects, you know, God and creation, war, worship, wisdom, sin and evil, judgment, justice, and the coming of the Messiah. The theme is expressing the full range of human experience, emotion and devotion in worshiping God. Well, there are different types of, of Psalms, and so... Um, we've written down here some of the some of the types of songs, and um, the first is praise. There, there, there are psalms that are called people to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, right? Um, and they were made for the purpose of praising God, um, praising something about God's character, or so on. Many of these are psalms of ascent. Uh, what that meant is that as people would go to Jerusalem every year for Passover and, you know, for the different feasts, as they would ascend, right, up into Jerusalem, they would sing these songs of praise. Uh, and they were they're meant to be participatory, that people together as they're walking together would sing together these psalms of ascent as they would go into Jerusalem to worship and to go to the temple and praise God. So many of these are called Psalms of Ascent, and they're calling people, come, let's praise the Lord, praise the Lord for this, and, and as they're going into the temple to worship. Then you have a couple that are called the Royal Psalms, and these ones are talking about uh, the actions of Israel's kings, but specifically the Messiah. Uh, an example of this is Psalm chapter 2, right? So it talks about the kings and kings of the earth, but ultimately it's talking about God's king that he puts on his throne. Then you have psalms of thanksgiving, right? They, they're, they're praising God, describing past trouble, and then they're saying how God has helped in the situation and how he will continue to help because he is faithful and includes with this, this gratitude towards the Lord. Example is Psalm chapter 30. Another one is uh, psalms of a lament, right? Or complaint, uh, most common uh, are psalms that you see are these songs of a lament, of sadness, or they're complaining about something. And why is it this way, God? I don't understand, right? And it's, it's just, so it's this confession and repentance of personal sin, a petition for help in a situation because 
uh, of what's going on, the presence of enemies or during sickness and disease, his prayer for deliverance, for God to help, asking for help and pledging to serve God when forgiveness is granted. So there's individual laments for himself, like such as Psalm chapter 70, and there's also community laments, you know, as, as a community the laments, like Psalm chapter 90. And then there are uh, wisdom psalms. And these ones are contained wise teaching, uh, but in the form of a psalm. And so uh, they are meant for to instruct people on how they ought to live. A great example of this, Psalm chapter 1. Uh, these are wisdom psalms. And the psalms show such a, a, a wide array, array of human emotions and expressions. That's why when you pick up the psalms, you can always connect to it at some point. Just recently during COVID-19, uh, I've been homeschooling my kids. And so we picked up the book of Psalms and we just read through a psalm a day. And it's amazing how similar David feels to how my children are feeling through this COVID-19. And it's because scripture is always relevant. And the kids are identifying with aspects of, of David saying, why is this happening? Well, when will this end? Right? Uh, and they, 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 they identify with that. So it's been very meaningful. Uh, in different times of my life, the Psalms are where I go to for comfort, for direction, for encouragement, for rebuke. Uh, but it's a place to go uh, because the Psalms are so raw and so real. Uh, let's move on to the book of Proverbs. I know we're skipping fast through this in, the, in this section. I know this that we're going to be kind of, again, I'll skim me over the top real quickly to get through this, but please forgive me for that. Let's move into the book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. It's one of my favorites. When I was 14 years old, uh, my father <laughs> sat down and he said, Son, come, let us reason together, said my father. And uh, he's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to spend some time together. So every Wednesday, uh, he would take me out to the restaurant and I would order myself a white chocolate brownie with ice cream and whipping cream on top. It was my highlight of my week and a pitcher of iced tea. And we would just, we would just eat and have and, and nachos. My dad would get nachos. And we would read one of these, we would read through the psalm or the Proverbs rather. And there are 31 Proverbs, right? In the book of Proverbs, similar to 31 days, rare vowels, right, in our months. And so we would read a, a proverb a day. And whatever proverb we were on on Wednesday, we would talk about that proverb. We would talk about our weeks and so on. Um, but we would get together and just talk through this. Because my dad's, the pre, his thesis was just as, as Solomon poured wisdom into his son, said, come son, seek wisdom. He wanted to do that with me. And so he began with me reading Proverbs, a proverb a day from that point. Uh, from that point. Now, I did that when I was about, uh, probably about 20 to 25 years ago. To this day, my father still reads a proverb a day. Sadly, I, I don't read a proverb a day. I, I read Proverbs and miss my reading plans, but I don't do it the same way. But I admire him. To this day, he still reads a proverb a day. So whatever day it is, that's the proverb he reads. And I really admire that in my father. But what he did was poured wisdom into me um, and poured his time into me. And so as a father, that's something that I want to do with my kids. And I do do that. Take my kids out and we, we do things like that. Um, but it's important. Going right back to what we've talked about uh, continually through this course, right? From the Shema about teaching your children. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Take every opportunity to teach your kids and to pour into them who Christ is and what he expects of us. So the book of Proverbs is a, is a great book. Uh, I, I've, during this last week, I've been doing this with my kids. I've been reading Proverbs every day. And, and they, they laugh at some. Some of them are funny. Some of them are sad and serious. Uh, but just words of wisdom. Uh, so... The theme is how to live at peace with God and our fellow man. Like if you've listened to the Proverbs, it's really about if you do this, this is what you do to be wise. And this is how you're going to live in such a way as not to offend or cause trouble, right, with either God or other people. The foundational scripture 
comes from chapter 1, verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that's where it begins. Our, our right understanding of who God is and our right perspective that he is in heaven and we are on earth is the beginning of understanding. Because the moment that we elevate ourselves, right, and we think we are so great, we miss God. When we put God in his place and us in our place, then we have the beginning of knowledge and understanding. Uh, I've heard this described as this verse as what wisdom is and what this is, is is recognized is putting God in his place and us in our place. And that's the foundation of understanding um, what it is that God would have for us. So there are different types of Proverbs. If you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll see there are different forms of writing and how it's written. Um, and so let's talk about some of those here. First is there's ones that are called opposite parallel. So the, the, the two stanzas, they, they parallel each other, but they're opposite, right? For example, hatred stirs up trouble, right? But love overlooks the wrongs that others do. Sometimes these are, have, uh, these are, they're, they have the conjunction uh, but in there, right? So this, but this. Um, so the other one, so that's opposite parallels. So there's one, and then they show the parallel, but in the opposite. Then there's similar parallel. Uh, the, state, the same statement or instruction is given twice in a similar way. It's kind of a, a different way of saying it, right? The same idea is restated in different words. Sometimes the second line makes the point more strongly than the first line did. For example, use wisdom and understanding to establish your home. That's the first line. Second is, let good sense fill the room with priceless treasure. So there's one line that's true, and then another line that embellishes or further explains it, right? So they're, they're two parallel, but they're similar. And then there's what we call single treatment. And they're just these little snippets of, of wisdom that just says this is what it is. They're often strong, bold, uh, simple statements or warnings. For example... Even fools seem smart when they are quiet, right? Uh, so there's just these small statements. These are the ones my kids really like. Um, and then there's a statement with an explanation. The first line is concrete image, which is then explained by a second line. For example, from Proverbs chapter 20, an angry ruler is like a roaring lion, right? Make either one angry and you are dead. So it's this, this statement, and then it gives a little bit more context, a little bit more uh, uh, explanation, kind of the, that there. And then you have chapters 28, 15. Oh, uh, the next section, one is called a comparison. So it compares two different images. Um, so it compares one thing or person to another. Uh, these are called metaphors, right? So a ruler who mistreats the poor is like, a roaring lion or bear hunting for food. So you have these comparisons. So you'll see uh, this is like this, or just as this, so is this. These are You'll, you'll see that all through the Proverbs as well. Um, those are called comparison Proverbs. And then you have the descriptive list. Um, so you have usually three or four answers that follow a statement based on an unspoken question. Okay. So those are... Uh, those examples. Here's an example here from Proverbs chapter 30. There are three or four things I can't understand. How eagles fly so high or snakes crawl on rocks. How ships sail the ocean or people fall in love. So these are examples of those lists. And then there's uh, the if then statement or the or else instructions, right? Uh, this the second part explains the consequences of doing or not doing something. The or else is usually implied but not stated, right? For example, it's better to take hold of a mad dog by the ears rather than to keep part in, uh, than to take part in someone else's argument. Or if you obey God, you will have something to leave your grandchildren. This is a, there is a consequence to this. That's another name for this type of proverb. There's a, there, what are the consequences 
uh, of that. So if this happens, then this will happen. Is do this rather than this, right? Or else. Uh, those that's the book of Proverbs. Okay, let's move into the book of Ecclesiastes. I know this is going to be dizzying as we go this fast through the, these books. Ecclesiastes. Um, it's attributed to Solomon. We don't um, know that definitively. Uh, the author ident himself, identifies himself as Kohelet, which means teacher, uh, instructor in Hebrew, um, or preacher. And uh, the word Ecclesiastes means um, to for the assembly, right? Uh, so it's uh, coming together and, and having a meeting as an assembly. That's what this means. Um, so the preacher, or the Kohelet, explores the age-old quest for happiness and fulfillment in life through rhetorical dialogue. Now, there's a little caution, a little warning here. Um, be careful not to take what is being written here out of its context. Remember, the whole book talks about finding pleasure and finding different things, right? But be careful in how you read it. You got to read uh, Ecclesiastes as a whole, because the conclusion uh, makes uh, th all of it make sense, right? It, it brings all of it together. But the whole point of all of the book of Ecclesiastes is that pursuit of happiness and pleasures in anything other than God is meaningless. And he goes through and talks about his, the pursuit of that and how everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. Uh, so the theme is wrestling with the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? Some emphasis found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, observation of all life is that life is meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. All life is vanity. It's vain. And so it talks about the vanity of pleasure, of work, of our own wisdom, of all of life, of, of leaving an inheritance to somebody. What's the point? Right? Uh, earthly existence. There's a whole section on there's a time for everything that the birds made popular in a song. Uh, vanity of acquiring riches, uh, abundance and wealth, political popularity, words and dreams and uh, loving the abundance, laughter, injustice, vanity of childhood and youth, vanity of vanities, it all is vanity, chapter 1, verse 2. And it underscores the emptiness of pursuit of pleasure and happiness and fulfillment outside of God. Because God created us to enjoy life. God created us. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be to be fulfilled. But only when that's found in Him. The conclusion says, what gives life meaning? And here's the conclusion of the matter. He says, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's it. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. In other words, don't wait till you're old. Right? Don't wait till you've tried to pursue. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't wait to try to pursue happiness and everything else. And at the end of your life, say, okay, now, now I'm going to follow God. He's like, no, no, no. If, if you want a life that's meaningful, start pursuing God in your youth. Follow him. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because that's where joy comes from. Now we, we look at that as the keeping of commandments. How is joy in that? Everything that God has done and instructed is for our good and for our enjoyment. We sometimes think of the words like commandments and laws as things to be obeyed that are obligatory. That, that, that are somehow joy, um, void of any type of joy. But read through the Psalms. Psalms you know, 119 goes through all of this and says, I delight in the law of the Lord, right? How many times in the first part of that, that chapter, 
His everything is about how much he, how much David loves God's decrees. He loves his law. He loves his commandments. Every word that is spoken, because God's word brings life, not restriction, not not the the, the um, squashing of joy. We could say, but God's law brings joy, abundance of joy, to be to know Him, to know Him, and to know what He has commands is to have a relationship with him. And that's really at the bottom line of what, what he is saying in the book of Ecclesiastes, the same thing that David says all the way through the Psalms, is that our joy is being close to God, to knowing him. To know him is to love him. And so to be in his word. And so at the end of his life, Solomon says everything else is meaningless. Just be with the Lord. Just know God. The irony in this, perhaps, is that Solomon's life did not end that way, did it? He ended his life rather pursuing his, the gods of his wives, and his heart was turned away from the Lord. So again, a sad description of a leader who did not finish well. But he gives us the recipe, and I wish he would, in all of his wisdom, would have followed his own advice. And follow it to the end. The next book that we're going to look at is this book, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, or um, Canticle of Canticles, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is not a book that was quickly accepted into our Bible, into our canon. Um, I believe it was the second to last book, last or second to last book that was actually. Uh, voted on and like approved as a, okay, yeah, we're going to accept this as a um, bar, part of our canon. Um, but part of it is because it's content, right? The Book of Song of Solomon it was a bit confusing for people. So w whether we should include this in scripture or not, and, and so, but what it is, <clears throat> the book has very diff two different Two very different uh, interpretations. So let's talk about this um, because you've probably heard both, one or both of these. One is an allegorical love song between Christ and his bride, the church. Right? Going back to Ephesians chapter 5, 25. That just says Christ loved the church and gave himself up. So there's this beautiful picture in Ephesians, right, of, of Jesus' love for his church and how he lays down his life for his the church. And so some have said this is an allegorical uh, uh, song that's uh, indicative of this relationship that is between Christ and the church. And so this kind of mirrors that. And so you're looking at this book, of Song of Solomon, in light of the church. That's number one. Number two, the second interpretation is, uh, is a love song that extols the beauty of a loving and intimate relationship between a bride and a groom and God's high plan for marriage and sexuality. Right? You can look at Hebrews 13, verse 4. Um, I think it's the latter. I don't think this has to do with Christ and the church. So we got to be very careful of, of uh, adding, remember, adding into the text and reading into the text something that's not there. Uh, Solomon wasn't referring to anything other than a relationship, a beautiful relationship between a man and a woman, a husband, and a wife. And it shows God's uh, intention for monogamous marriage and the love and the passion that exists within the confines of marriage. Uh, so the theme of this book is a love poem that shows God's high plan for loving relationships that are mutually beneficial, right? That they're, they're, they're love each other and fulfill each other in this. That's you know, what the whole point of the book of Song of Solomon is. So the inclusion of this book in the canon of scriptures was debated. Some saw it as a love poem, other saw it as an allegory of God and his spiritual bride, both positions of merit, uh, the one that God created physical love within his um, prescribed boundaries to be enjoyed and honored, the other of God's love for his church and the church of his bride. Okay. Let's look at the big picture of the book of um, Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. <clears throat> Number one is love must be pure and permanent. 
It's got to have those two P's, right? Pure and permanent. Uh, romantic happiness comes by being exclusive and faithful to the same person. Second, this love expressed in poetic language uh, is very pastoral in nature and expressed in terms of metaphor, right? So it's there's this visions like her hair is like flocks of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Now, I've tried using that line on my wife, and it didn't quite go off quite as Solomon uh, intended to it. So, I, I don't know. I've also told my wife that she has a neck like a Tower of David. Didn't get very far with that one either. So, uh, this imagery, uh, I'm sure it did something for women back in, in those days. Um, but uh, don't try it with your spouse, your wife. Um, and it's a reminder of God's expectations of his people. Uh, faithfulness to the covenant relationship with him, right? Just as marriage is intended between one man and one woman, pure and permanent, likewise, it is a, how he wants us to relate to him, right? Having a relationship with him that is pure, God alone, and permanent, right? To the end, not, not living three quarters of our lives following God, and then at the end thinking, yeah, okay, I was going to do it for myself now. I, we talked about seven out of ten leaders fail, right? No, God's desire for us is that we live in a relationship with her, him that's pure and permanent and monogamous, right? He says, you shall have no other gods, right? It's like when I married my wife, I, was, I will have no other women. Uh, which is this, this pledge to you. Uh, several times, the reader is admonished. It says, not to awaken love until it is ready. Why is this important? Um, my father explained that verse to me when I remember I was when I was younger. I had this girl when I was dating. I don't know what your stories are, but I was dating and I saw this girl and I thought she has got to be the one. I had just, I thought I liked her. I was dating her. I just I liked her. And I remember my dad says, "You know, it's not you're not ready. It's not that time." I remember him sitting down and says, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. That's, that's how he explained it to me. And he said, you know, because the moment that you start walking down that road, you're going to awaken feelings that are premature. And so um, wait until it's the right time. And of course, I was like, dad, this is the right time. This is the girl. I, I know that it is the one. You know, and uh, it wasn't until I actually met my wife that I realized what love was. I thought there's, you know, it's other girls that I, I liked and all through. But when I met my wife, I realized now I understand. This is what I mean. This is, this is what love is. And so, I mean, I, I talked to my kids are young. Uh, my son just turned 12. And uh, he's not really interested except for one girl. He's just there's this one girl, and I said, Joshua, there's time. There's time. Do not arouse or awaken love until so I said the same thing my father said to me. Um, but it's important not to rush in. And I know uh, in, in our society today, there's so much about, well, just try it, right? Our, our kids and, and young people are just, you know, trying relationships to see see how it goes and, and see which one kind of you like. And there's all kinds of other implications to that. But the truth is, there is a time, that Ecclesiastes, right? There is a time for everything, including love. And God's intention is for one man and one woman uh, in the confines of marriage, uh, and that to be pure and that to be permanent. And that cannot be rushed, and I cannot be, uh, you have to wait until God's timing. So anyway, just a little quick word about dating. All right, let's look at the book of Job. I love the book of Job. It's one of those books that is so often misquoted. Um, the book of Job is a series of speeches between Job and his friends. And, and then the answers uh, that God brings in the middle of this, or actually his questions rather. Um, but it really is, it addresses the question of um, why do the righteous suffer? I mean, that's, the question that everyone has is probably in my ministry 
the number one question that I have, at least in some form that I have to deal with, is why does God allow this to happen? How can God allow um, evil to exist? Right? It's the problem of evil. How can God allow the righteous people to suffer? Why does this happen? Um, and it's so pre prevalent in everything, um, in, in our culture, e even in our churches, we have it. I remember when I came home from the mission field, and I had, um, I had been diagnosed with cancer when we came back. And I, had, I just found out, we had announced to our church, uh, at the time where I was going to Kingsway Church, uh, pastoral staff there, we announced to the church that, that we, I had cancer. And I remember a young lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I can't believe that you have cancer. She said, these were her words, how can God let you have cancer after all you've done for him? I wasn't very sensitive to her question and I looked at her like, what, what do you mean all I've done for him? Why would I have any kind of special treatment than anybody else? doesn't matter what I've done for God. That, that means nothing. Why would I expect anything different? But I understand the reasoning behind the question is the assumption that is that you are good and you do good, good will happen. This is a kind of a karma belief, not a Christian belief, right? If you do good, good will happen. If you do bad, then bad will happen. Well, if that's your, your paradigm your, your, for, for life, then of course what happens is you can't explain things about why do bad things happen to good people or good things happen to the bad people. Um, so this, this book really addresses this issue, but here's what is interesting about the book of Job. It doesn't give you an answer. It acknowledges the presence of evil and the injustice of e evil, right? But what it does is it, it centers on patient endurance. At the end of the day, it's about, um, bad things happen. But yet, keep your eyes on the Lord. Um, the theme is, why is there human suffering? Big picture view of the content. The story begins with a demonstration of Job's righteous acts. Right, Who he is, how great he is as a person, all the stuff he does. It kind of sets the stage for this problem. Right? Why do good things bad things happen to good people? Uh, so it sets up the stage for how, how successful he was and how great he was. And then there's this wager, this great wager. And, um, you know, Satan is arguing with God, right? And he says, well, have you considered my servant Job? God asked Satan. And, and he says, he's righteous. And Satan says, the only reason he's righteous is because you've given him all this stuff. If you take the stuff away, he will turn from you. And so God stakes his reputation on Job, and he says, no, he, he is faithful to me. So go ahead, take it all away from him. You just can't kill him, right? Um, but you can take it all away from him, and I will show you that he will still be faithful to me. So <clears throat> that's what happens. Satan, Satan attacks and takes all of these things, and within the course of a day, he loses everything, right? His family, his his wealth is everything is taken from him it, and his wife is, is frustrated and says why are you still holding on to your integrity <laughs> curse god and die you know and uh, she wasn't much of an encourager but you know he had these three friends right and the three friends they come and they and they sit with job and they come and they bring him wisdom just you know, they sit with him. I think it was for three days. They said nothing. That was probably the best thing they ever did. They say nothing. And then these comforters, they come and, and they share their observations. And these three men represent the wisdom of our world today. We hear this over and over again. And this is where Job gets so often misinterpreted. Because people will take the things that the comforters, his friends say uh, to Job as as prescriptive not descriptive remember scripture is telling you what happened right uh in this particular genre is telling you what happened it's not telling you how things should happen so sometimes people will read what the comforters what the, what job's friends are saying as this is truth but if you read to the end of the book you discover that god rebukes them 
and says that they were wrong in what they said. So be careful when you're, when you're quoting from Job not to quote the friends, okay? Because at the end of the book, we discover everything they said was wrong. Uh, but sometimes we get stuck. I think people who casually read scripture or don't read it with a critical eye uh, miss this part of it. Uh, they can misquote scripture or the meaning of scripture by quoting the Job's friends. Anyway, uh, remember that not all the things that they say are true. Uh, careful not to build your doctrine on that part of it. A major theme is that Job has sinned, right? And because he sinned, this is what's happening. This is why his friends, this is their logic, right? So, Job, you think you're righteous, but clearly there's sin in your life because all this stuff is happening for a reason, right? It's that whole karma mentality. Uh, so you've done something bad, so this is why bad is happening to you. This creeps into our thinking today, even into our churches, where we have people who think, well, the reason that you're sick right now is because there's sin in your life. The reason that this is happening to you is because there's sin in your life. That's Job's friends. That's not, that's not the heart of our God. And, and so it, it sneaks into our own thinking that, that God somehow is out to, to, to inflict all of this on us because of, you know, our sin. Um, and so clearly all of this is happening uh, because there's sin in your life. Uh, that's what Job's friend says, and they were clearly wrong. Because God allowed Satan to do this so that God could show his glory through Job. At the end of all of this, um, after all of Job's friends have their little conversation and they go through all of what they have to say, finally, um, Job gets up. You know, and each one of his friends has said, you know, there's sin in your life. And he said, oh, I'm righteous. I'm righteous, right? And then, it's interestingly, Job goes through and he's defending himself, defending himself, defending himself. And then his last, the last of his three friends, the youngest of them, gets up and basically his argument was, you know what, you were righteous, maybe, but now you've become so arrogant and proud in all of this, you're actually saying what you said you weren't. Um, and then at the end of all of it, you have Job gives his, his frustration and he cries out to God and says, why is this happening? And then God comes down and he does not give Job an answer. He gives them a series of questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Do you know how this works? Do you know? Do you understand? Clearly, Job, you must know all things since you are so wise to question me. And at the end of it, <clears throat> after all of God, God speaks all of his words, Job sits back and he says, Wow. Clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about. He says, you know, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen. And the unspoken answer to all of this is, God is in heaven, God is God, and we are not. And he gets the perspective. God is in charge, and I am not. That is the really at the bottom, at the end of the day, is the answer to the problem of evil. When we have the perspective of who he is, in, in, when in the middle of our suffering, in the middle of what's going on, when we can see God clearly, it gives us perspective. That God is in heaven, and we are not. And so my, my suffering makes sense in light of eternity, and not into what I see, what I see how I see things. God is in control. God has everything in his hands. And when we get to that perspective, we can say, you know, I had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. There's where we find the peace. Job never got an answer, but what he got was perspective. And when his perspective changed, he was no longer questioning why. He was just so amazed with the beauty of God. And it was at that point that God restored Job, everything to Job, 
Now the, the story of Job ends with being res, everything being restored, which sometimes on this earth we don't see. Right? That is not everyone's story on earth. Uh, that we see the restoration of all of that. But what is true about all of us that we can find in the middle of our suffering is a perspective. And if we truly seek him, if we truly humble ourselves in the midst of our suffering, our suffering and look to God, he will give us a renewed perspective of who he is. And that is enough. For me, when I found out I had cancer and all of that, of course, anytime you hear those words, you have cancer. It's shocking. It's, it's hard to digest. What about the future? What about my children? Uh, my, my youngest was only a couple months, four months old. Uh, and so I was sitting there con confused. But it was in the midst of that that I, I had an incredible amount of joy in that season of our life. In fact, my wife Elizabeth and I often reflect on those times where we're saying, how were we so joyful in the midst of all the stuff that was happening in our lives? Because it wasn't just that. Uh, cancer was one of uh, a host of other things that had gone wrong in our life. And we sat there and we said, the reason is we had a renewed perspective of who God was. And the suffering was when seen in perspective through the, through the lens of who God is, is not as evil. It's not, it's not so overwhelming. And there's nothing that we can't endure we have that perspective. That's the perspective that Paul talks about in the book of Philippians, right? And he, he gets this. He, he understood, understands the meaning of life in terms of who God is because of his incomparable worth, right? So the book of Job deals with this, that the answer to the problem of evil is when we look to him, we get that perspective, he changes our hearts. Um, so suggestions is to study the complete statements made by the major characters, right? Which are the, the friends and Job. And then study what God says. Uh, what are some of the assumptions that are made? What are, what are their arguments? And recognize the basic questions and look for some answers that are given. A great, uh, a great book to read is the book by Philip Yancey, Disappointed with God. Um, it's really good for giving us perspective for how we see our suffering and how God sees us in the midst of our suffering. So I, I would encourage you to, to pick that up and read that. All right, let's move into the Minor Power of Prophets, part six, and see if we can get through this by the end of today. Uh, the Minor Prophets uh, are called, uh, this section is often called the Book of the Twelve, uh, because all of these 12 Minor Prophets are kind of stuck into one. Um, and so this is written over a period of 400 years. And it, it really encapsulates a whole bunch of different audiences, uh, whether they're speaking to Israel um, or speaking to uh, the nation of Judah, so on. So uh, some of them are speaking against the nations that are around them. So uh, it really deals with a whole lot of different stuff. But it really we can be treated as, as kind of one section, one book, with 12 parts. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, see Appendix 2 for principles of how to deal with prophecy uh, as to help you as you study prophecy on your own. Okay, the first book, the earliest book, is the book of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet, and he ministered in the northern kingdom, which is Israel, uh, during the chaotic period right before the Assyrians came in in 722 B.C. Uh, it's one of the most well-known parts of this story is Hosea's wife and how God asked him to marry a prostitute uh, who was unfaithful to him to teach him and to illustrate to the people what it feels like to have a unfaithful bride such as Israel to him. Um, the theme is that God speaks to his people who have been seduced by these false gods. So big picture view of the content. Chapter 1 to 3, Hosea uh, marriage to Gomer. Uh, an unfaithful wife that is a type of Israel's unfaithfulness. Hosea's love and mercy for Gomer mirrors the love of God for Israel. Just as, just as he is, loves her, 
despite her unfaithfulness, so does God love his people despite their unfaithfulness. God's constant love and his redemption for even when his people stray away from him. The chapters 4 to 14 is a series of speeches with den- which denounces Israel's sin, right? It says what you've done is wrong, but it also promises restoration. Again, a theme throughout the prophets. Pro- pro- prophecy of destruction, right? And a promise of restoration. Uh, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And nowhere in the Old Testament is that more clearly seen than in the book of Hosea. And his heart for restoration of his people. Uh, his heart for, for drawing them in. And it's what we see uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Hosea 6 says, Come, let us return to the Lord. Come, let us be with him. Uh, Israel has prostituted herself to all of her other lovers, the Canaanites and the Assyrian deities. And and there's some graphic definitions of what that looks like, but that mirrors the graphicness, uh, is that a word? The graphic nature of our idolatry and our pursuit of other pleasures, other gods, other things, things to satisfy outside of God. Um, and then the next section says that God had every right to divorce her and expel the unfaithful wife. It was within Hosea's right in the, in the law to, to expel her because of her unfaithfulness. Just as it is within God's right, as the covenant maker with it, she has broken covenant, but Israel has broken covenant with God. Therefore, he has the right to say, okay, I'm done with you. This covenant is over. You have broken it. I, I have, there's no, it, it is now broken. But yet God continues to keep her despite her unfaithfulness. Hosea portrays God as willing and ready to take back his wayward people. The book of Joel. Uh, why do so many things go wrong? That's, right? God speaks to a world that is torn by calamity. But Joel is this prophet that brings hope. God called the prophet Joel to help people cope and to give meaning and purpose to the seeming meaninglessness of the situation that they were in. The theme is God's promise to restore what has been lost. The big picture of the content is, uh, pay attention, has anything like this ever happened before? The first half, uh, chapters 1-1 to 2-17, is this lamenting or this weeping over sin. It says, turn to the Lord. Come on, come back to the Lord wholeheartedly. And there's a connection between the drought that they're going through as a nation and the sin of the people. And so Joel cries out for relief to God. And the second half, uh, chapter 2, 18 to 3, 21, is God's jealousy for his people. Uh, in response to their prayer and lamenting, God would expel the foreign invaders and he would also renew their crops. So uh, because of your prayer, because of your crying out to God, uh, he would expel the foreign, the people who have come in to try to take over the land and renew their crop crops. Uh, the day of the Lord is mentioned in most all of the prophetic books, but in many of the different prophetic books, they have a different um, maybe I should say, perspective of the day of, day of the Lord. And to Joel, the day of the Lord was a day of vindication for Judah, which were the ones who were uh, threatened uh, in the first half of this book. Uh, the day of the Lord was a day of vindication for Judah, that God would deal with his, their enemies and he would restore Judah. It is this also a book that's quoted in the New Testament. Peter quotes this at the day of Pentecost. Um, and um, he, he quotes from Joel, uh, you know, your sons and daughters and old men and young men dream dreams and visions. And that particular aspect of uh, Acts chapter 2 is actually quoted from Joel. Um, and it gives an explanation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the next is God is for his people and rescues those that he loves. That's a theme 
throughout the book of Joel. God love is God is for his people and he rescues those he loves. It's for you and he will rescue you. Joel, as well as the book of Amos, which we'll look at next, um, painted the day of the Lord as a day of judgment that was coming, which differed from the accepted belief that saw the day of the Lord as a time of God's blessing after hardship. So some people, some of the prophets look at the day of the Lord as what happens when, when God basically shows up and brings the blessing. For Joel and Amos, they use the term day of the Lord to refer to the judgment that's coming. And that, that is the vindication is coming is the day of the Lord. Amos is the next book. Amos does not claim to be a prophet, but rather he's just a person who's heard from God and he's willing to be his messenger. Right? He's like, I'm not saying that I'm his prophet. I'm just saying God gave me a word and here it is. Also emphasize the universal sovereignty of God, which extends beyond Israel and Judah's borders to the nations around them. Now, I mean, I think I mentioned this earlier in the course, but I took a class in seminary on minor prophets and we started with Amos. And we only, um, we didn't really, we didn't even finish the book of Amos in our 36 hours of, of teaching. And so there's so much we could get into, into all of these books, including Amos. So. I feel bad that we're just kind of skipping over them, but it is the scope of our course. Let's quickly look at the big picture view of the content. Uh, the big picture is that Amos, Amos pronounces judgment on the neighboring nations for their oppression of Israel and Judah. So he looks at all the nations around him. He's like Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and Edom and uh, Ammon and Moab. And he says, because of this, and he says and talks about each of their sins specifically, and the judgment that's coming on this nation, and then this nation, and this nation. And then he gets to, to Israel, and he says, and Israel, you're no better off. And then he says, and Judah, guess what? You're no better off either. You all have done sin, and God is bringing justice. Amos next turns his prophetic utterance towards God's people. Um, like Joel, Amos speaks of the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. The people of Israel expected to escape the day of the Lord, right? They, they felt like, Oh, God was going to come to their rescue and destroy everybody else. And Amos is like, no, man, you, you guys are doing the same things. You're worshiping the same gods. You're doing the same detestable practices. God is still against you. In fact, he says, you are worse off than any other because you knew better. You have God's law. They didn't have God's law. They're, they're being held accountable to God's law. and They don't even have it. You have God's law. So therefore, all the judgment is coming on them. It's coming on you and more because you knew better. Uh, then Amos also has a demand for social justice. There's things that, that Amos is, talks about that God hates. Um, he's against the money lenders, selling people into slavery. Uh, he says, let justice flow like water and righteousness like a river. For Amos, this is an issue of morality, not of legality. He holds God's people to a higher standard that transcends external adherences to just the laws. And there are moral principles that they're violating in violation of God's character. And so uh, Amos is all about justice. Okay, let's look at the book of Obadiah. Obadiah means worshiper of the Lord or servant of the Lord. And the book is set in Jerusalem sometime after the destruction of the city in 586 BC. Obadiah anticipates the return of the exiles and the recovery of the land of Israel. There's a close relationship exists between Obadiah and Jeremiah chapter 49 because it was during the same period of time uh, that these two were written. The theme is universal judgment and the restoration of Israel and the establishment of the kingdom of God. The big picture view of the content. Uh, it starts off with the punishment of Edom is deserved because Edom, the Edomites did not help. And in fact, they laughed at, at, laughed at the people of Israel and, and, and exploited them in, in, in the midst of their uh, punishment. So he's saying, Edom, you guys are in trouble. Now, if you don't know Edom or what Edomites are, these are the descendants of Esau. So let's go back to Jacob, who was called Israel. Jacob had two sons, right? Uh, Isaac, I'm sorry. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Uh, and so... Jacob, God, God confirmed his covenant with Jacob and Israel, and that's God's people. Esau was, was absolutely uh, 
angry and he, he, he hated Jacob, right? He tried to kill Jacob. Like he was so furious with him for stealing his birthright. And Esau became the father of the Edomites, the Edomite nations. And so, of course, when God's people went taken into slavery, they were like, ha, see, this is what happens. And they pointed fingers and laughed. And so Obadiah's point is, listen, you guys are kind of like relatives here. You should have known better. You should have been the first to take our back. Because of that, God's judgment is against you, and he will wipe you out, every last one of you. So Obadiah chapter 1, uh, 1 uh, to 4, so verses four, 1 to 14 is about Edom's judgment and the reasons for it. And verses 15 and 21 is the day of the Lord will be a day of universal judgment, the restoration of Israel and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Next book is Jonah. Jonah revolves around a city of Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. So let's kind of go back just a little bit and think about our, the history that we've talked covered so far. Remember, uh, under Hosea and Shalmaneser took away took the the Israelite or, um, nation, the northern nation, into captivity into Assyria. So Assyria now owns all of that land. In the midst of all of that, it, the capital of Assyria is um, Nineveh. And so this is a, obviously a hated place, especially for God's people. And so, I mean, right, they, this, these are the foreign invaders that have taken them into captivity. They're wicked and evil. And so uh, this is God telling him, I want you to go to a foreign land. So this is not a prophecy to Judah or to Israel. This is actually a prophecy to a nation around them. And uh, there is a strong us versus them in this in this story. He, he really, uh, Joan is wrestling with these racial prejudices. He can't stand these people. In fact, he thinks that they deserve judgment. So the very fact that God calls to him is angering to Jonah. Um, and so this book contains many lessons. Not, uh, not the least is obedience and the consequence of disobedience. So, theme is God is merciful, and we should be too. Right? God is merciful to who he will be merciful to, and we ought to be. There's no reason why we should hold back our mercy from anybody. A big picture of view of the content. God charges Jonah to go to Nineveh and warn because of judgment. Right? So Jonah says, all right, I'll go. He goes and catches a boat and he goes the opposite direction as fast and as far as he can. Uh, he flees to Tarshish. But of course, in the midst of that, God brings a storm and they cast lots and they discover that it was it was Jonah. He says, yes. And uh, God, so they throw him overboard at his bequest and he is swallowed up by a big fish. Uh, and then Jonah spends three days in the belly of a fish in which he realizes this is all happening because of my disobedience. So fine, I'll go. And God spits him up on the, on the land and says, all right, uh, my guess is that this fish just swam to, towards Nineveh and took him half, took him, you know, the, the journey and then spits him up on the land and Jonah says, fine, I will go and I will tell him. So he goes into the to the city, and I'm sure because you know Jonah preaches, you know they're they're all going to be, um, they're all going to be destroyed. And I'm sure he went in there, and he wanted to be as unconvincing as he could be. Just think about this: Jonah had no love for the Ninevites; he didn't want them to repent. So he probably goes in there, monotone, God's going to judge you. Uh, he's, he's probably as boring. He's, he's not trying to get anyone. You know, you, you see these these revival preachers, right? And they're trying to, to hype people up. And, uh, and he probably just says, okay, guess what? God's going to judge you all. So there, that's the message. As soon as as soon as soon the Ninevites heard it and the king heard it, they fell on their face and they repented. And Jonah goes out of the city and he's kicking the rocks and he's mad, right? And he's like, God... I knew you were just, I knew you were merciful. I knew you were merciful. And he's frustrated with God. Because it's, what is your deal, right? Uh, how, how dare you be so upset, right? He's like, but Jonah's frustrated. Why? Because he has this racial prejudice against those people. 
And so um, then there's the whole story of he sits out there and he just wants to die, just wants to sit out there and, and die. And so God causes this, this plant to grow up and bring him shade. And so he's sitting out there in the hot desert. And he's like, oh, finally some shade. And then God withers it up and he gets mad at God again and this is frustrated and he says why do you care more about this plant that I may come up in a day and I killed you care more about that than all the people in Nineveh how is that the interesting thing is at the end of the book it does not tell you if Jonah changed his heart it doesn't there's no redemption to the story there's no prologue it says that Jonah's heart was changed and he said oh you're right God I will be merciful to whom you are merciful yeah, there's, there's no kind of a clue conclusion like that simply the end of the book ends with Jonah being frustrated and God being right he's saying you have no right to be upset about this you should be more concerned about those people because that's what I'm concerned about it really shows God's heart for the nations Right? God is merciful. That he loves every person equally. Which is why he has no room for prejudice. There is no room for prejudice or racism in his kingdom. That is what the mystery of Ephesians, right? It's talking about this great mystery, how God brought Jews and Gentiles into one people as one. Um, and the thing that the, the early church struggled with, the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church. Why? Because they had all of these prejudices against them for who they were, what they perceived, their presuppositions about those people. That's why I have zero tolerance for any type of racism, any type of prejudice, because God has zero tolerance for any type of racism. And that is the message of Jonah. Okay, Micah. Micah is a champion of the common people. Right? His message reveals a great concern for the, all of the stuff that was going on in society that was inappropriate and that was wrong, violated God's commands. So Micah 5.2 contains one of the most important messianic prophecies as well as a powerful message of what God desired of us. Micah 6.8. You can check those out. Um, theme. God speaks to leaders abusing their power and speaks of the restoration of his kingdom. <coughs> so, excuse me, big picture view of the content. The book is divided into four sections. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, well, we're going to, clearly we've, we're, we've been talking for a while, but we got a little ways to go yet. Um, the book is divided into four sections. Each section is followed by a proclamation of judgment and a promise of hope. Section one talks about honesty and justice among people. Um, then section two talks about honesty and justice among leaders. Section three is about the punishment and redemption of Jerusalem. And section four is about the punishment for injustice and idolatry. Um, Micah is speaking against the sinfulness of what's going on in Judah. Uh, you'll see the word Zion and uh, Jerusalem. These are all synonymous. Uh, Mount Zion, uh, the mountain the, where Jerusalem, the temple, um, the nation of Judah, they're kind of all synonymous when you see those in here, uh, referring to God's people, chosen people specifically as um, the spiritual remnant in Jerusalem and Judea. Okay, Samaria, uh, Israel uh, had fallen, and Jerusalem, which is Judah, would fall if it did not repent. Now, Samaria... Uh, it's the area, because remember the Assyrian army took over um, Israel. So I need to kind of mention this because it kind of sets up where where the New Testament comes in. Because the Assyrian Empire took over Israel, right? Um, that area became known as Samaria, which in the New Testament are the Samaritans, right? Remember the Samaritan woman at the well. And she said, you know, we worship on these mountains, but you worship in Jerusalem. She's referring to Jeroboam. She's referring to what had happened when they when they set up their own uh, worship in their own area. And so the Samaritans are this mixture between the remnant of Israel, the northern tribes, that assimilated with the Assyrians and intermarried. That's what the Samaria, Samaritans are. Uh, but at this particular point in history, they are the, 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 the people who are in Israel, um, the northern tribes are being referred to as Samaria, Samaritans. 
So Samaria, which is Israel and Assyria uh, mixed, had fallen, and Jerusalem would soon fall if they did not repent. So this book occurs after the fall of Israel, obviously, and right before the fall of Jerusalem. Micah summarizes God's requirements and how people have failed to meet them. Um, and then Micah 6, 6, 8. Um, and it's written out there. We'll just kind of move on to the next section. Um, my, Micah predicts that there is going to be a righteous remnant. There will be the remnant of Judah, which is the righteous. So not all of Judah was righteous. Not all of Israel was righteous. But God is keeping for himself a remnant. And this becomes very important when we look later on in our next, in our live session together. We're going to be talking about the exile and Babylon because the remnant becomes the key factor uh, of who, who the nation of Israel is. It's this righteous remnant. And Micah speaks about that in the midst of all that's happening and nationally, God is preserving for himself a spiritual remnant of people. And then Micah speaks of Judah's renewal. And that the kingdom will be restored. And Micah's message is that hope is coming. Okay, let's look at the book of Nahum. The book is named after its author, whose name means comfort. A key scripture is Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. It says, the Lord is slow to anger. And verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. The theme is comfort. Uh, comfort Judah by assuring them that God will defeat all those who think they are undefeatable. For, for their God is for them and against anyone who stands to oppress them. God's uh, the big picture of the content is God's vengeance upon those who are his enemies, but also knows his own. Those who plot against the Lord uh, and their end, verses 1, uh, chapter 1, 9 to 13. Uh, also, the evil and the strength of Nineveh are no match for God. Okay, so this is the same Nineveh that Jonah uh, prophesied to, right? So this is, these are uh, contemporaries. Uh, the answer to the question the people are asking is, why is God mad? Answer, idolatry. <laughs> um, and then the promise of that there will be a restoration. Um, and then lastly, another th big picture uh, view here is that there's the futility of trusting in human strength alone. Okay, assignment number six. Nahum and Jonah involve the same city and the same God. Why is there such great difference between the two and such different representation of God towards this people? Is Jonah 4.2 and Nahum 1, 2, and 3 correct? And why? This is going to take a little bit of uh, inductive study here. Uh, take some time, look look this up, and think about this. Um, what's going on here with these two two places? Okay, let's move into uh, Habakkuk. Sometimes called Habakkuk. We're going to call it Habakkuk because that's how you pronounce it in Hebrew. Okay, the short and often ignored book is a dialogue between the prophet. And God. Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Remember Jeremiah, let's just, just refresh because it's helpful for us to think this through. Jeremiah was prophesying, right, during the captivity, right? So he was there watching uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come and take the people off into exile. And he's weeping over his city. And so Habakkuk is during the same period, uh, period of time. Um, so why bother when this whole thing is futile, right? This is, this is, this is happening. So history has meaning if one takes a long view and judges events through the perspective of faith, right? So if you, if you look at something in the moment, a situation is happening in the moment, it can seem meaningless and out of place. Uh, but we're supposed to have a much bigger view which is God's view of a situation. Um, and that's what happens here. God uh, gives Habakkuk a bigger view. Uh, theme is God's judgment of sinners. 
So big picture view of the content. The first two chapters contain Habakkuk's complaint that is, this is just not fair, right? What's happening isn't fair. It, the, the crime doesn't fit the punishment is what he's saying, right? None of this. Is. Um, and then it goes into God's punishment of sinners is coming. Uh, and the righteous should live by faith. Habakkuk 2 um, talks about tell others, publish the vision. Excuse me. And uh, the, the righteous shall live by faith, which becomes a theme within the New Testament. Um, God promises to take care of evil, but to the righteous, he says this. Hang on. Don't quit. Don't give in. Right? Just keep the faith. Habakkuk is waiting for God to act, and the prophet employs the law of retaliation. So in Habakkuk 2, 6-8, we see this, that this treatment would be fair. Um, but interestingly, God doesn't respond to him. God doesn't say, um, you're right, yeah, an eye for an eye, that, that, that's right, no. Nope. Uh, he just kind of lets Habakkuk say his thing. In Habakkuk 2, 14, it says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And the last chapter records the prophet's prayer and his confession. So it really shows, the whole book shows Habakkuk's journey from his frustration to his, Come on, God, why don't, we, why don't you do it this way? And, and then the end of it, it's his, Okay, Lord, you're right. You know what you're doing, basically. And I trust you. So I conf I'm, my confession. And isn't this a journey that we kind of we take when we face questions like Job? Uh, why is there evil? Why is this happening? This doesn't seem fair. doesn't seem right. And then we, we, say, God, we suggest to God, why don't you do it this way? At the end of it, we sit back and say, okay, you're right, God. You know what you're doing. And I trust you. Uh, let's look at Zephaniah. God speaks to people yearning for utopia, while being aware of their failure. Zephaniah demonstrates a great familiarity with the royal court and contains a blend of political insight and spiritual understanding. Uh, he was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Nahum and Habakkuk. The theme is after punishment, there is restoration. The big picture view of the content is the day of the Lord is coming. A day of judgment, God's judgment on the nations. Um, and it begins with judgment that purges and salvation then can follow. So God's judgment comes. And what is that is to do is to deal with all the sin, get all of the evil out. Then once that is dealt with, then God can restore. Then God can come through. That's it's a story of salvation, really, right? Until there is repentance and confession and this contrite heart there can't be a restoration right so that has to this judgment has to come and it has to purge out everything so that salvation can come the redemption of the righteous remnant again this theme of the remnant there is going there's a, a a contingency of people a remnant of what is left of people that are spiritually um, alive that god is preserving he's preserves them through this judgment all the way through Babylon to captivity, and they are the ones who are going to come back afterwards, and God will rest restore his covenant with them. So of Israel, it says this, <clears throat> they had a bright beginning, right? Genesis 12, 2, right? That all nations blessed by in you, and Israel was chosen by God to be the example of true worship and true obedience to the world. I mean, they, they started off so good. Right? They, they had the law, they had God, they had everything that they needed, and they were supposed to bless the world through them. That was God's covenant. But they forgot that that's, this was their job, was to represent God to the world. Instead of representing God to the world, they rather would look like the world, which corrupted their hearts and their mission and their purpose, and they became corrupt. Um, because they they... they uh, they forgot the responsibilities that come to uh, the privilege and the leadership. Uh, and the leadership became corrupt. Uh, the people became complacent, right? 
they weren't as concerned about following after God's commands. They, they kind of lost that, that love, that joy that they had for God, and they became complacent. God continued, however, to keep his covenant in spite of the idolatry of the people who continually just moved further and further away from God towards the idols and the religions of the world, nations around them. Yet God continued to be faithful. And then last is the nations would be changed and see and serve the Lord. And one day, all the nations will see that God is God. God's response to the questions that were raised is utopia, this idea of this, of this perfect place, you're never going to find it without God. Um, this armament won't save them. Nothing. You, you, you can't have that without God. And the other thing is, wealth isn't going to save you. Your money isn't going to save you. You're not going to be protected by your strength or by your money. Uh, the end of Zephaniah pictures God as the king. So let's do a student response here. And that is, I just put it past it. Uh, what is the importance of the statement, the righteous shall live by faith for living in our day? Uh, take that in context also the book of Romans. And then think about uh, what is the importance for that for us today. All right, I think we have a couple more books, three more books to hit. And then we will be done. Let's look at the book of Haggai. The prophet Haggai encouraged those who had returned from exile in Babylon to rebuild the temple, which was a visible sign of a renewal of the people, both physically and spiritually. So we're talking now after 70 years of the time in Babylon, the people come back. And this is the context in which Haggai is prophesying. And he says, now that you've returned, you've got to rebuild the temple. Um, and this is a visible sign of what God is doing in his nation of renewing you and rebuilding you. <clears throat> the theme is that God addresses misguided priorities. The big picture is, Haggai points to the fact that the temple is in ruins. The temple has been neglected. While the people were building your own houses, uh, the audience did not realize the truth of Matthew chapter 6, 33. Um, here they were, they were building up their own houses and they were neglecting the house of God. And so he's saying, there, there's a disconnect here, guys. God is the one who's brought you back. And so you need to build a temple because that is a visual um, evidence like, of what God is doing in his, in his land. People are in the land uh, 16 years and despite efforts, they have not really prospered. Haggai ties the future prosperity of Jerusalem with the rebuilding of the temple. In other words, you haven't prioritized God. Okay? You expected to come back here and everything would just be great, land flowing with milk and honey, but you've prioritized yourselves. You have not prioritized God. So rebuilding the temple first gets the priorities right and puts God's first. Their misled priorities are exactly what led them into captivity to begin with. Um, another uh, part of uh, this book, the theme is that the gold belongs to God, right? That everything is, is his. The idea that, that what we have, and what, how God is blessed to you is from him. It is all his. Uh, and we ought to be putting him first. There's hope for Zerubbabel. Uh, Zerubbabel was the one who was tasked with the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, as he came back in the first wave of captive cap, from from Babylon, and and how he Zerubbabel will be like a signet ring, uh, it seemed to indicate that he would reign as a king, or at least a priestly king, that, and God would overthrow the throne of the kingdoms around them. At that time, it was the Persian Empire, because the Babylonian Empire uh, had been um, overtaken by the Persian Empire. And presumably a proper government, like the temple and the Davidic kings and so on, that would be reestablished there. Okay, let's move on to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet. 
he also was post-exilic, which means after the exile, and after they came back from Babylon. And he also was prophesying to, at the same particular time as Haggai was. Um, Zechariah has many prophetic, uh, a messianic prophecies, I'm sorry, and also would fit into the genre of apocalyptic literature, which is referring to end times, or at least to, to future end of the world stuff. Uh, chapters 9 to 14 are described as the capstone of the twelve. And the Lord will be king over the whole earth. Okay, a theme. God speaks to a world desperate about its future. Uh, big picture is eight night visions that are apocalyptic in nature. That's kind of what you see here. So let's look at the, the, the what was being emphasized here in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah highlights the most common problem in Israel's history which is their failure to keep the covenant um, as God's chosen people. In the first eight chapters, reflect the strength of a community of faith. Uh, first chapter is a call to repentance. And there's eight, these eight night visions that are apocalyptic in nature. The whole community uh, is supposed to be working together, and there's encouragement and discouragement of God's people. Uh, also, Zechariah contains the most messianic message of any of the minor prophets. Uh, it talks about united they stand, divided they fall. Uh, and the chapters uh, contained here is, is in these chapters, the, the monarchy didn't work. Um, the people ignore the temple. Uh, they ignore their need to, to live in a covenant relationship, to be humble and, re and repent. Uh, and so Jerusalem is under attack. Uh, Haggai says, Haggai, Zechariah champions Zerubbabel and promotes Joshua as high priest. And reminded the people of these things, that on that day there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. To rally the people to rebuild the temple and to rekindle their hope in God after their captivity. About rebuilding the temple and our final hope cannot hinge upon man, but in God alone. And then in Zechariah, there are a list of Messianic scriptures that you can see in appendix chapter, or appendix number five, not chapter five, appendix five. All right. All right, we're at the last book here, Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Bible, or the Bible, of the Old Testament, and the last book of this particular section. Malachi's name means my messenger. A similarity exists between the message of Malachi as well as the message of Nehemiah. Um, both address similar concerns, concerns. And Nehemiah is a book that we will talk about in our next session. Theme, God speaks to a society devoid of responsibility. Here's a big picture view of the content of Malachi. God's faithfulness to his covenant with his people. Doesn't that sound like a theme in every book right, of the Old Testament? God's faithfulness to his covenant people and the disobedience of those people. Um, Israel's unfaithfulness is rebuked. Malachi condemns the flippant attitude of God's people towards divorce and marriage uh, and to people of other faith, right? So they were, they were just kind of treating marriage, uh, the sanctity of marriage, with contempt. And they were marrying the people, very people that God said not to. Do not intermarry with the nations around you because they will lead you into idolatry. Um, and so the next section is the Lord's coming is announced. Malachi warns of God's judgment upon his people for their sorcery, adultery, and their oppression to the poor. Three things that God detests. Right? Um, it talks about faithful giving, Malachi chapter 3. It's about the tithes and the offerings, right? And faithful giving. Um, godly offspring. Malachi prophesies of the Messiah and his forerunner, which we identify as Elijah, right? Uh, or John the Baptist, identified in the New Testament as an archetype, a type of Elijah. Uh, and then Malachi contains many beautiful metaphors of God. This is probably my, my favorite part of Malachi. It, it, it shows God as Father, 
right? Who loves the orphan, who loves the outcast. He is the father to the fatherless. Um, it shows him as the great king who rules with justice and honor. Uh, and then lastly, as the one who is the refiner. Right? He refines, as you refine precious metals, he refines his people uh, and presents them to himself in purity. The whole book of the Twelve concludes with the idea that God's people cannot seem to stay faithful in their covenant relationship with God. But one day, God will change all of that forever. And it is the foreshadowing of the new covenant and the coming of Jesus. There ends part six and, and our lecture for today. Part seven uh, it will be when we come back together for our live Zoom meeting that we're going to have uh, in a couple weeks from now. So uh, we'll then we will finish up the exile and the return in the rest of this chapter. All right. Thank you. And we will see you live.